Please welcome the director, Lisa Zumwalt. And please welcome Sasha altman Dubrow to moderate this conversation, and I think do a little more than that. Um, hey everyone, how y'all doing? Good, super glad you're here. Um, so first, I, I just want to say it's an honor to, to sit next to you and to actually meet you in person. I feel the same way about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I just want to thank everyone who's in the, you know, who's in the audience tonight, because I feel like this is a really important conversation that, that, uh, that should be happening more. And, um, and it's like one of these complex conversations that, uh, that you know, I feel like ends up getting overlooked a bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for a couple minutes and just in, like say like frame you know my perspective on this and then and then we can talk. So um, so my I feel very directly connected to this film and the story because I'm someone who uh, when I was when I was Eric's age you know we, uh, I've also had the experience of being. Uh, locked up and and forced to take medications against my will, like on four different occasions in my life. Um, and luckily, I didn't actually have, you know, a court order. I was not like, uh, you know, I didn't have like a AOT order. Um, but to just to frame to to frame our discussion, the the context that we we know of each other because. I ended up founding an organization with my friends called the Icarus Project, which was a national network of peer-based mental health support groups. And the, the thing with the Icarus Project was we were a bunch of people like Eric who um, were trying to figure out ways how to, ways of how to navigate our, you know, our extreme mental states um, without taking, you know, traditional routes. And for some of us, um, like people like me, like I decided to, to take the drugs, like I take psychiatric medications every day, but then there's all these people in my community who don't. Um, and here's the, here's the part that I think is, uh, is really, I wanna make sure we, we talk about. So I ended up getting a job in the psychiatric system and I work at the New York State Psychiatric Institute now and I'm the person who trains all the peer specialists on assertive community treatment teams in, in New York State. And um, ACT teams, as they call them, are the ones who are in, are in charge of enforcing assisted out tra patient treatment. And I think, for me, watching this film, one of the things that's very striking, that's kind of horrifying, um, is that here we have an example of a young man who comes from incredible privilege. His father is a doctor, and he has access to resources, and it has this like really nice family and a big home and all of these things. Um, but the majority of people who are put on assisted outpatient treatment are, are folks who have way less resources. And if you look statistically at like what's going on in New York, um, it's black and brown folks who are the ones who are, who are getting AOT, orders put on them. And so I think the, the, the horrifying thing for me is watching this film and thinking, even this kid who has so much um, couldn't, couldn't escape it. And so for, like, I think of myself as a very um, empowered person with a serious mental illness. And yet, um, when it comes down to it, like, it wouldn't be that hard to just take, take our, our power away. So, so just with that, um, I'm just wondering, I mean, this film came out a, a couple years ago now, and I'm just, I would just love to hear your thoughts on, I mean, here we are in New York State, so different cultural context. Um, what's your sense of, I don't know, what have you learned from making this film? I know, it's all the big, How yeah. long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> in like a few minutes, you know? <laughs> uh, it's such a hard question because I feel like um, I learned so much. I, I started with an interest in what people who had been psychiatrically diagnosed had to say about their own experience. That was my departure point. And 
at that time, I, th I didn't really know very much. So I thought that people just needed to take drugs and they'd be fine and so would we. That, that's where I started. Uh, when I started learning and talking to people who were diagnosed, I realized it was much more complex than that. Um, and one of the first things I learned was that um, even though psychiatric drugs are basically always offered to people, um, they don't work for everybody. They work great for some people, but they don't work for everybody. So that led me to ask a question. So what? So now what? You know, and I got interested in forced treatment because that for me is where the rubber meets the road. You know, that's where, quote unquote, the interests of the community are going to come into direct conflict, possibly with the interests of the individual. And what do we do about that? Um, you know, our American values really, really esteem liberty, the value of choice, being able to do what you want to do. I just had a procedure recently, and I had to sign a whole bunch of things that said that I consented to do that. Eric didn't get that. Why not? That's a serious question. Why not? Because he's crazy? Well, what exactly do we mean by that? One of the important things I think that Sasha and many others have done is to re-examine the paradigm of mental illness and say, what are we talking about when we're talking about crazy? And for me, as a person who not as, you know, I'm not diagnosed, no one in my family is diagnosed, so that's not where the interest in the film came from for me. But for me, the question was, okay, well, that's kind of blowing my mind what you guys are saying. I'm very interested, but I'm also feeling like that affects the paradigms of normal. It has something to do with me, too. So those are a few of the things. I hope you guys will jump in as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so what I'd say for folks who aren't familiar with the, the kind of, I don't know, the, the kind of language that we've been creating over a bunch of years, I mean, we start, I feel like it's really important when you have conversations like this that you start from the place that just acknowledging that the society that we live in is actually pretty sick. You know, and that, that really, is, and it, it gets complicated when we start talking about disabilities. Okay, this is a mental health film and a disability film festival, but what's the disability? Is it, you know, like the way I think about it for myself is that I'm incredibly sensitive. And what that means is that that sensitivity means that if I don't take really good care of myself, I could be a danger to myself or to others. But that's in a, that's in a context in which, you know, I mean, just off the top of my head, you know, there's that study that came out a few years ago about voice hearing and about how they looked at the kind of voices that people hear in different parts of the world, and the voices people hear in this country are way more violent, way more violent than, let's say, in India, or, you know? And so what does that say? If we're, you know, is there's individual individual mental illness, but it's happening in a, in a larger social context. And I feel like that's a huge piece of it. And then so when, it, when we think about, well, what, what do we do about that? It's not just a question of um, figuring out how to provide more services or like how do we lock people up? It's actually about restructuring the way our society looks. So it's like actually it ha there's more of a tolerance for difference. So I feel like that's like the that's the frame that I have to keep at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. The the boss of my bosses in this film, Jeffrey Lieberman, um, and that guy. Did you was that your interview with him? Or did you, I bought that one. You bought that. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to get his permission to use it. Yeah, I mean, like you know, the the the, the frame at the place where I work is that people have biological brain diseases, mm -hmm. and they get research to research those biological brain diseases to see if they can like cure them. And it's bullshit. That's just not the reality of that. That's just not the reality of, of people. That's not, there is no schizophrenia that's just like a, something that you can cure by finding a drug or that you, you know, there, there, there are drugs that you can take that can help kind of, um, get, well, ma I heard the word mask out there. I mean, that's, you know, like, ma like you know, I, manage, you know? I take a drug called lithium. Uh, it's really helpful to me. It also has like created a tremor in my hands, you know, from taking it for a long time. It's like fucked up, but I'm trying to figure out what to do about it. <laughs> um, all right, y'all, questions? Uh, the, you first, yeah, you. So, um, what would, my sister was 
um, hospitalized against her will when I was growing up a few times, and they put her on horrible drugs. Um, how would you, what would you suggest to help educate parents so that if we were to redo it now, she wouldn't have been shot up on all the Haldol that she didn't need? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, well, so when I was first put in, on all that Haldol, um, you know, I was 18 years old, and my mom, who's some, right there, um, she, went to, she went to a class, there's this organization, NAMI, the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, and they told my mom, um, it's not your fault, <laughs> and it's a disease like any other, that, uh, like, it's like diabetes, if you have diabetes, you take insulin, and if you, you, uh, you know, if you have bipolar disorder, you take these drugs, um, and that was really leaving out a lot of, a lot of pieces. I mean, it, like, fundamentally, it, what I've ended up focusing my work on is like developing peer support, is people who've been through similar things can help each other in ways that other people can't. So I think that um, there's, a, there's a peer movement in the mental health system that's very complicated, but um, fundamentally, I think we need to be building peer support mm -hmm. communities and networks. I, I just want to add to that that um, I think if we don't pathologize extreme states, we can help people who are experiencing them. For me, one of the most important lines in the film is when David Oak says, you know, we need to empower people who are have, you know, experiencing mental health problems, not disempower them. And so if someone's hearing voices, we can assure them that actually lots of people hear voices. And, you know, we don't have to say, okay, that's something we need to stop right now. Right. Which I think takes a cultural shift, you know? It, it, doesn't, just, it doesn't just happen. Um, yeah. Well, I came because I haven't seen Lisa since sixth grade. <laughs> so it's sort of this a reunion, an elementary school reunion. <laughs> but grade. I cannot believe how affected I was by the film. I mean, I had tears in my eyes the whole time because I didn't realize these things were still happening. How did one, did you, how did you find Eric and which of the four states that you were safe in? Um, I found Eric on um, mental health rights networks. Rick was freaked out that he was being medicated at 10 times the amount and he posted about it and I called him up and said, are you interested in a film? And he said, no. And, uh, but he posted again, and then he said, if Eric wants to do it, I'll do it. Um, what was the second question? Oh, the four. I don't think you're safe necessarily in any state. I mean, Massachusetts is always touted as being the state where, you know, it can't happen here. But I've talked to people in Massachusetts, and if they want to put you away, they will. I mean, if they think they have probable cause, I think they can go to a judge and do it. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I, don't, I, I actually don't know. But, but if you were asking the question about the four states because you're interested in, like, other people out there who are talking and organizing, I would, I mean, I feel like people in the audience should know about Mad in America, which is a website that a lot of people write on, like me, and, yeah. Uh, as you know, Sasha, I'm a documentary filmmaker for the last 15 years, and you know some of the people. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in the film, as well as in myself and in my experience as a documentary film, is, and you touched on it about being sensitive. I, I've discovered in myself and in others that as an artist, we want to be as sensitive as we possibly can be. But people who have mental challenges tend to be too sensitive for their own good. And with a lot of the people I know, including Eric, I've noticed and including myself, that I have authority issues. And a lot of what I saw in Eric was his battle for his own independence. His authority uh, issues w w made him run with his, sh his sh uh, shoes tied together. And a lot of the people I've known who have these challenges and who have been hospitalized are, are, are battling uh, authority uh, in their own mind. Do you have any thoughts on that, both of you? Um, 
I wish maybe you could say more. I mean, I, I might have the same problem Eric does. I'm a bit of a rebel myself. And if I was uh, diagnosed and told that, you know, had Eric's experience, I might be rebelling against that. I mean, for me, it's not a rebellion. It's a matter of agency. And agency is extremely important to me. So how would you disentangle those two? For me? Oh. That's All the way up here. <clears throat> Sasha, I realize that this is probably an oversimplified question, but are there any circumstances under which you think people can legitimately, legitimately be forced to take medication? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. You can go for it. Um, that's a great question, and um, I was on a panel with another filmmaker who made a really interesting film about uh, two people who fell in love and were diagnosed uh, bipolar, and of course their life fell apart totally, and they wanted to like run away and be free together, and it didn't work. And the answer was they had to take medication. So, um, so when he saw crazy, he was like, well, I don't subscribe to that at all. And I said, okay, well, what do you subscribe to? And he said, well, I'm diagnosed bipolar, and I have a written document that says that if I start acting this way and I, you know, and I do certain things, then you need to take me to the hospital and you need to give me medication whether I want it or not. And I said, I think we agree because it's your choice. So I would say forced medication would, is a great idea on that basis. Yeah, so and, and from my perspective, you know, I feel like, okay, here's my, like, just let me see if I can get it out in a couple sentences. I actually feel like there have been times where I've been forcefully medicated where it was, it was helpful to me. Um, I also think that the difference between me and a lot of people in my community is that I don't have a serious trauma history that preceded that. And I feel like a lot of people I know who end up being forced to take medicine have really horrible reactions to it because, they, they, because, because of earlier trauma that they have in their life. Part one. Part two, um, I think the ability, I mean, it, we're talking about insight and what the, like having, having insight and understanding and no one's gonna get me to have the insight that I have a biological brain disease or a mental illness. That's just like not gonna happen because I just don't believe it. Um, do I believe that I have dangerous gifts and that I have like superpowers and I need to take drugs to control them? Yes, I do, you know? And I, it's like just as scientifically valid, it not you know. It's just we're that like, and I think there's, I I think that having the, um, I think the answer is, yeah. Sometimes, there you go. Hi, I'm sorry. What is your name? The one in the purple. Sasha. 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 Okay. Um, you mentioned that in the upper. If you're more wealthier, then you don't have as much support. Well, I need to ask you about a particular situation. I, actually, what I said is if you're wealthier, you have more support. That's what you have, like, if, like and, and that if you don't, oh. yeah. Okay, well, anyway, I have to ask you about a particular situation. I live in Forest Hills in an apartment building that would be considered upper. I'm going to stop you for a moment. I think you should take this as on a one-on-one -on -one basis with him later, and um, and the questions should be more relevant to the general film and everything else, uh, bigger picture. But um, but take it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'm sure Sasha will be happy to answer. Hi, it's a great film. Um, I researched this area, so I, I'm glad you had Whitaker in there. And um, and the film was made when a couple of years ago. In sixteen. In 16, yeah, because there's so much research coming out now about what's going on in the drug industry and the whole false, you know, the false premise behind a lot of the research. Um, so I was, I was, I was curious. You did, you didn't. I mean, you had Whitaker and you had David Oakes, but um, you didn't want to go into the whole controversy over the long-term research effects and the wonderful research that's coming out in Scandinavia now. You know, where they're, I mean, around the world they're now looking at first psychotic break as if you treat it differently, people can actually recover and it does, they view it as a worsening disease. You know, that you'll have a psychotic break and that you'll continue to get worse as opposed to if you work with the first psychotic break 
and provide psychosocial treatments. Right, that's what yeah. Whitaker says, right? He said he, he was the one that raised the issue that most of the drug trials are short term, right? And, and short, there's no question that short term drugs uh, have a very positive effect, but long term, maybe not as much or less so, or competitively with psychosocial. Um, I just decided not to go into big pharma. That's a huge thing. There are a bunch of other films that have covered that really, really well. I wanted to tell, my thing is to tell a person, uh, to try to raise the issues through a personal story. So I, I sort of made a hybrid film where I had a couple of experts, but not too many and not for too long, you know, because I wanted you to stay in the story. Those are the choices I made. We have time for one last question. Hi, thank you. Um, this might be too explosive for the this venue. Uh -oh. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Not explosive, just there are different perspectives. So we're talking about not imposing treatment. We're talking about reframing what is mental health slash mental illness. Where, where is the agency in the determination of if an individual has the right to choose self-harm? <laughs> Where's the agency self-harm? I mean, you know, it, it really depends on what you mean by self-harm. I mean, do, are you talking, like, you're talking about, I mean... Does someone have the right? Eric believed that he, that you, that you do, that one, he, that he would have the right to self-harm if that was his choice. That's one answer. Yeah, I, I'm part of a community of people who take really seriously that, I mean, this is, this, this is how I will, this is how I'll answer your question, hopefully it's helpful. Um, I feel like there's this incredible fear of talking about self-harm in society. There, and and there's, a, there's a real, um, there's, there's so much legal liability that's caught up in it and just, you know, I work in a place that if you're a clinician, if like anyone talks at all about hurting themselves, it's like there, you, you have to report it. Um, and there's people, we, we have friends who are doing these support groups called Alternatives to Suicide where people like get together and talk about their relationship to suicide um, without clinicians there. And it's peer, it's peer support and, it, and it's really, um, it's like, incredibly powerful because it take it like what ends up happening is like like anything in this society if you're scared to talk about it it like goes underground and then it, it ends up being something where uh you know the power ends up the this is how i will finish since this is the last question i will say in the movement that i am a part of there's a slogan people use they say nothing about us without us right and the idea is like, if we don't speak, we, if we don't get to talk about for ourselves what's going on, other people are gonna do the talking for us. And I feel like that's what I saw in this film over and over again, is that there were like these authority figures that were talking for, for Eric. And I wanna be a part of a, a society where people feel more comfortable being able to like have conversations about self-harm and it's not like, it's not like some crazy thing because lots of people are thinking about self-harm. Lots of, thinking of people are thinking about killing themselves. Like in this room, like multiple, like statistically there's a bunch of you that think about killing yourselves. So like, so, and it's not a mental illness, you know? And like, so anyway, that's it. Thanks. I, I, have, I have one more question. Um, where is Eric and um, what, have, what has developed since the film? Oh, okay. Um, Right, microphone. Um, That's late. I am happy to report Eric is doing great. He um, is still working at the Peer Respite House. He had trouble because of his arrest record getting work in, is in the scientific field. So he's thinking about doing um, actually peer-related science work in mental health now. And he's also gotten married a couple of years ago, and he's very happy with his wife. Yay. Yay, Yay. yeah. Happy ending.